e poi eh, dunque condividi condividi questo adobe vedete una foto vedete il file pdf li vediamo proprio sì, io lo vedo bene sì. so, we begin now to tell the very interesting story of how Lie algebras and therefore the proper mathematical setup uh, to treat uh, um, continuous uh, symmetries like rotation symmetries and eventually also Lorentz transformations uh, that are at the basis of special relativity were developed uh, starting from the 70s of the 19th century. And two persons, uh, in fact, you see four persons there in this transparency, Sophus Lee, Felix Klein, Gaston Darbou, and Camille Jean. Uh, the name Lee Algebras, uh, obviously, uh, Lee groups, uh, obviously, points into the direction of Sophus Lee as the main figure uh, that developed uh, this concept. So uh, it is interesting uh, to understand how all this development that is so momentous for physics, not only for mathematics, but particularly for physics, uh, since at the very end of the day, nowadays, uh, we have a theory of uh, fundamental interactions uh, that is a gauge theory and is called the standard model and it's based uh, on the notion of uh, a connection on a principal bundle but the main ingredient uh, to understand the geometry of bundles and therefore at the end of the day gauge theories, and if you prefer, uh, the fundamental theory of fundamental interactions is that very notion of uh, a continuous group and its infinitesimal formulation that is uh, the Lie So how this came into being uh, and um, how does it happen, uh, did it happen that uh, such a person as Sophus Lee, who is a Norwegian, who was a Norwegian, came to uh, develop such a concept. So the story is the following. Uh, Sophus Lee was a young man uh, of about uh, 20s, a little bit uh, over 20, uh, in 1870. Uh, more or less the same age as Felix Klein, who was in state of German and who is one of the main mathematicians of uh, uh, the 19th century. And these two young men met first in Berlin and then they went together to Paris. And they happened to be in Paris just in the spring of 1870, a few weeks before, few weeks before the uh, Franco-Prussian um, war uh, broke up between uh, Russia and French, and France, and uh, as you know, that was really the beginning of this three uh, main war of uh, the century in, in the Franco-Prussian War are the roots of the Second War, of the First World War, exactly as the Second World War has its roots in the first one. It was uh, probably one of the uh, first uh, modern uh, um, war where uh, very big massacres uh, took place 
the whole landscape of Europe uh, changed. Uh, Germany emerged uh, uh, from that uh, war uh, as a united uh, uh, country. Uh, and France uh, was humiliated uh, uh, to a very high uh, degree. And so the political consequences of uh, uh, that war uh, are very momentous. Uh, Napoleon III fell, uh, uh, there was the Third Republic in France and all that. Um, what was uh, the reason why uh, Sophus Lee and Felix Klein went to Paris? Well, Sophus Lee had uh, uh, made uh, his uh, original studies, uh, uh, university studies in Christiania, nowadays uh, named Oslo, the capital of Norway, with at that time was still uh, a sort of protectorate of Sweden, was not completely independent uh, Norway. It was formally an independent uh, kingdom, but the king of Norway was the same as the king of Sweden. So uh, more or less like the United Kingdom uh, uh, that unified Scotland uh, and Britain. And the Norwegians uh, uh, made a small nation as they make nowadays. Uh, it was a rather poor nation at that time. Uh, but uh, um, in, in Norway, there were at least in the 19th century two extremely bright and uh, very, very important mathematicians. One is Abel, that died before and also went to France, and uh, Sophus Lee was the second one. So he made his studies there. He was uh, quite um, brilliant as a student. And uh, after his uh, diploma, um, let's say at the level of uh, uh, doctoral student, he got um, a fellowship from the government uh, of Norway to travel to Europe and to go to the main uh, uh, centers of mathematics of that time that were in Germany and in France. So he went first to Berlin, uh, where he met uh, Felix Klein, who was also a student uh, there. Uh, and then they made a stop. They became friends, very good friends. And they made a stop in Göttingen, uh, where Riemann had already died, Gauss had died, but um, there was still a very important tradition of mathematics there. Uh, and then they went to Paris. That was the second main center uh, of mathematics of the day. The, the, the French mathematicians were uh, very, very important in the history of mathematics of the 19th century, as you know, Cauchy, uh, Liville, um, and uh, uh, Darboux, uh, Jordan, uh, and all these people. Uh, we discussed the fact that Camille Jordan was the first uh, French mathematician who uh, studied very seriously Galois theory uh, and made uh, even uh, a book on Galois theory. Also, Darbou uh, was uh, interested in group theory. Um, and so uh, what happened is that Klein and Lee uh, arriving in Paris uh, had the opportunity to talk to these two persons and other, of course, uh, mathematicians at the Ecole Normale, uh, and absorbed, both of them absorbed the ideas of group theory uh, from these uh, two slightly senior colleagues, uh, uh, French colleagues. 
um, they even wrote a paper together, uh, Klein and Lee, while being in Paris. Uh, but then they went uh, along different uh, roads. They had different views on the uh, use of group theory. Uh, talking about uh, Klein, what Klein did in the next coming two years was a major step in uh, understanding the role of group theory in geometry. Two years later, in 72, Klein was uh, the already full professor at the age of 24, uh, appointed uh, in the um, historical Bavarian city of Erlangen, uh, Erlangen University. And there he made uh, his uh, introductory lecture, just it was a tradition that new professor would uh, give a uh, public uh, lecture about uh, his uh, ideas and projects uh, um, in front uh, of all the faculty, the rector of the university and uh, students and also uh, people who were interested in listening to this uh, public lecture. And the public lecture given two years later by Klein uh, was uh, uh, later known in history as the Erlangen program. Uh, what uh, Felix Klein explained in this uh, momentous, really milestone in the history of mathematics was the idea that uh, geometries are classified by their invariance group. Uh, you, you have to understand that at that time, uh, uh, Boljai and Lobachevsky and also Gauss had uh, considered uh, non-Euclidean geometries. There was the tradition of projective geometry that uh, came uh, uh, down from even the 17th century, the Zarg and the Pascal. Uh, so there was um, a clear notion uh, or in the cultural milieu of uh, second half of the 19th century that geometry was not only a Euclidean geometry as uh, uh, our um, friend uh, Immanuel Kant thought and and used as an action uh, that Euclidean geometry is the basis of all of our way of thinking, and uh, nothing was less uh, true than that, uh, irrespectively of the importance of Immanuel Kant in the history of philosophy. So there was this notion that there were different geometries, but uh, Klein introduced uh, the main founding idea that is the following. What is a geometry? Geometry is the study more or less of figures. But uh, since the time of Plato and since the time of the ancient Greeks, two triangles, one uh, uh, here on the table, the other in another place on the table are identified. If I can take one, and superpose it uh, on the other. If they have the same angles, the same uh, um, uh, length, uh, it doesn't matter whether one is rotated uh, or translated in another place from the other, we consider that triangle as something unique. So starting from this uh, almost obvious observation, uh, uh, the same with the cube, uh, et cetera, which is, uh, so to say, subliminal in, in, the, in the thinking of, uh, uh, 
for, for centuries. Um, Felix Klein made the clear uh, identification of a geometry being the study of those properties of objects, of geometrical objects, which are invariant with respect to some group of motions. In the case of uh, Euclidean geometry, Euclidean geometry is the study of those properties of uh, plane or uh, space uh, objects that are invariant against uh, the transformations that, in fact, we call those of the Euclidean group, which means rotations and translations. But Zani said, look, but there are other groups. Uh, there is, for instance, a group um, that is larger and uh, adds to uh, translations and rotations, also dilatations, change of size, and uh, conformal transformation. So, a geometry that studies those properties that are invariant against the conformal group, which is the enlargement of that, is projective geometry. But there are other geometries, for instance, uh, the hyperbolic uh, geometry discovered by Labachevsky. And Klein was the first to understand that instead of having rotations uh, like those of the U in Euclidean space, you have other transformation that now we can uh, identify indeed with uh, uh, Lorentz uh, type of transformations uh, in. Uh, in the plane, for instance, uh, and that uh, the geometry of Lobachevsky that later was realized uh, by the so-called metric, Poincaré metric in the plane, but remember that a few years before, 60, uh, 1864 and 1860, Six, some, I cannot remember exactly the the, the date, but was uh, uh, some years before the 17, the 60s. Our great Italian mathematician Eugenio Beltrami made the first example, explicit realization of Geo of Lobachevsky geometry, hyperbolic geometry introducing the so-called uh, pseudosphere. He constructed uh, essentially uh, hyperboloids uh, as rotations surfaces. And uh, essentially, he introduced uh, as lines, the analog of straight lines uh, in uh, Euclidean space, what nowadays, uh, with our understanding of uh, differential geometry, we would call the geodesics uh, in, uh, on the pseudosphere. And uh, then he described uh, triangles and polygons on the surface uh, of the pseudosphere as figures made out of segments of geodesics. And it's true that, uh, uh, or as now modern English space showed, uh, I showed that um, the angles of such triangles are sum up to less than 180 degrees, and that the actions found by Lobachevsky uh, almost 30 years before, and also discussed by Boliai, the Hungarian mathematician, 
uh, were satisfied concretely in this model. So that was uh, the contribution of Klein immediately after the uh, the years in per um, the months in Paris. Then I tell you the details, quite uh, uh, strange uh, uh, of this um, visit to Paris. Uh, on the, but first, let me tell you what was instead the road of thinking, the direction of in Paris. Uh, Lee, who was more an analyst than a geometer, uh, had an idea. Galois had shown how to solve, or at least how to establish, the theory of algebraic equations on the basis of group theory. Lee had the idea that the next uh, most important object in mathematics are differential equations. We have algebraic equation and differential equation. So, <coughs> he was mainly concerned with differential equations, and he asked himself the question whether group theory might help in a Establishing the existence of solution, construct even solutions of differential equations. So, thinking along those lines, when he made a return to Norway after the visit in France, he applied himself to the study of differential equations and to the study of a new type of transformation. In algebraic equations, transformations were substitutions, and uh, namely permutation, etc., uh, etc. Et and the underlying group was a discrete group, even a finite group, Galois group. Uh, Lee started thinking about continuous transformations. And uh, so he started developing what he later called in German Transformationen Gruppen, a uh, group of transformations. Essentially, transformation groups uh, were changing of uh, variables uh, with some functions that involved parameters, and these parameters were continuous. But he came to consider infinitesimal transformations of that kind. And uh, his way of doing infinitesimal transformation was uh, not exactly conscious. He started doing something that nowadays we call constructing vector fields. We constructed first order differential operators depending on some parameters. And uh, it started applying these differential operators, first order differential operators, to its equations, some differential equations. And by a sort of complicated way of uh, turning around the question, he discovered that certain results could be obtained if the vector fields, what we nowadays call vector fields, but he called uh, first order differential operators, commuted to themselves with some constants. And uh, the consistency of these conditions led him to discover the concept of the algebras. So that was what he did in Oslo, namely Christiania, 
by the name of the time when he came back. But let us focus on their human story in France. They were discussing all that, they were collaborating and collaborating with the French people uh, in the month of uh, April, May, June, and uh, they came to July. But the beginning of July was when the war between uh, uh, Prussia and France broke up. Napoleon III fell into the trap uh, that uh, the, camps, the Czech of Prussia, Otto von Bismarck, had prepared and declared war on Prussia. This is what Bismarck wanted, and, and the rest we know. So now what uh, the situation was that actually Felix Klein was a Russian citizen. So with the breaking of the war, uh, he was a citizen of a country, uh, enemy of France. So he very, very uh, quickly left Paris, almost fled from Paris, just on time before the first battles took uh, place. And he repaired in Germany in order not to be uh, internated as a, a citizen of a man. Uh, of an enemy country. Uh, Scrooge was citizen of, Nor of Norway. That was absolutely neutral. Was not uh, participating to this war. So he thought that it would uh, be absolutely uh, at his place, and that there was no problem with him being in France. And he actually had the idea, since he was a very uh, athletic man, he was very tall, as many Scandinavians, and he was very athletic. Uh, he liked very much to run and to um, uh, walk. Uh, a story about Sophus Lee is that his uh, hometown is uh, about 60 kilometers from Christiania. And once, uh, uh, when he was a student, he discovered that he had left uh, an important book that he needed at home, at his home. Uh, and so he ran back in the morning to his home, took the book, and by the, the very evening was again back in Christiania. So he made 120 kilometers of walk in one day, which is certainly a record. So considering this uh, attitude uh, of Sophus Lee, uh, you should not be surprised by the idea that he uh, conceived the plan of going on foot from Paris to Milano uh, because he wanted uh, to meet uh, Brioschi, who was an important Italian mathematician of the time. He started his walk southward from Paris in direction of the Alps uh, because he was uh, leisurely thinking of going to Italy. That was also neutral at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, and it stayed neutral to the end of the war. Uh, but Someone had noticed that he was speaking German. Well, as a Norwegian, German was familiar to him. And since he had been discussing with uh, Sophus Lee all the time, uh, he had taken a lot of notes about mathematics, uh, about uh, the things they were discussing with the mathematical formula in German. 
So some stupid uh, uh, German, um, French uh, policeman uh, followed him and thought that he was a German spy. He took his notes, he arrested him at Fontainebleau, not very far from Paris, brought him to the local uh, station, and uh, he declared that it was, he was clearly a German spy, that his uh, mathematical uh, um, notes were some uh, cryptic uh, um, language, uh, spy language. I mean, all these symbols uh, were uh, some uh, code, spy code to communicate uh, um, things to, to the enemy. And so he was in serious danger and he was retained as a spy in prison for about a month. Then came, uh, fortunately, Darbou, uh, who was a very good friend, uh, knew about it and uh, about this fact. And he was, uh, at, the mo at the time, uh, a very uh, good friend of the minister, uh, one of the ministers uh, of the new French cabinet uh, that was created uh, during uh, after the fell, uh, after uh, Napoleon the uh, Third um, sur surrendered and was taken prisoner by by the Germans, um, so he went there and told, "Look, uh, idiot, uh, this poor friend of mine is a, a Norwegian uh, uh, citizen. He is a mathematician. Has nothing to do with the war. Please liberate him." And there were also, and he. Became also famous in Norway because uh, this arrest made uh, a lot of uh, rumor about um, uh, France uh, uh, on Norwegian newspapers, and he went back to he went back to Norway via Italy uh, as he had planned, and through Germany. But by, by the time Germany had become uh, the German Empire, as you know. And, uh, and then they embarked uh, from Kiel uh, uh, and went back to Oslo, uh, where he stayed uh, the next uh, uh, few years, developing Lie algebras, as I told you. Um, at a certain point, uh, he was writing uh, uh, to his friend uh, Felix Klein that he felt uh, quite isolated in Norway, quite isolated in Norway, because uh, uh, no one was following his ideas. That he had not uh, enough uh, discussions in mathematics uh, with other people. But he had become very famous in Norway. And because of that, a special uh, chair was created by the parliament, by Norwegian parliament in Oslo, in Christiania uh, University, specially for him. And uh, sometimes uh, um, old and stupid uh, professors of Christiania University uh, try to um, despise him, calling him the parliamentary professor, because he was not appointed by the university, but directly by the parliament. Um, okay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he was famous. He was uh, uh, well treated by his own government, but uh, he had not enough uh, um, communication with other mathematicians. So, Felix Klein, by the time, had shifted. Uh, from uh, Erlangen first to Munich, and then to Leipzig, to Leipzig, in Italian. Uh, in Leipzig, uh, he had a good student whose name uh, was Engels, like the philosopher, the friend of Karl Marx, but he was another person not connected uh, with Marxism. And, uh, 
Klein uh, dispatched his good student uh, to Oslo in order to become a sort of assistant of uh, Sophus Lee. It is important to note that and this is a very momentous uh, uh, series of, of happenings in the history of mathematics, uh, and very important uh, for, for future theory of relativity, that while being in Munich, Felix Klein, who had become uh, very famous at the level of uh, um, international level, in mathematics in Germany certainly but also abroad and had developed in Munich uh, a strong uh, school following his ideas he had uh, as postdocs uh, by quote unquote uh, two important uh, Italian mathematicians one of them was Luigi Bianchi a little bit later the first of them uh, was uh, Tullio Levi Civi. Uh, sorry, uh, it was uh, Gregorio Ricci Curbastro. Gregorio Ricci Curbastro, whose name is attached with the Ricci tensor, um, had been a student in Pisa uh, of Enrico Betti. Enrico Betti is another figure of primary importance in the, in the history of mathematics and physics uh, of uh, the second half of the 19th century. Uh, his name uh, is attached with the Betty numbers uh, because he was uh, considered uh, particularly by Poincaré the real initiator of topology. But he had also been uh, uh, important uh, in um, uh, in the theory of uh, in group theory because he he made uh, in Italy the same that Camille Jordan had done in France. He had written a paper on the theory of Galois, uh, which is still very good uh, to read nowadays. Uh, it's an exposition of Galois theory, which is still valid at the present time. And, uh, but the main importance of Enrico Petti is that he had been in the last, uh, yes, in 1859, uh, 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 just before the beginning of, uh, uh, 58, sorry, uh, just uh, the beginning of the Second uh, uh, Independence War uh, in Italy, he had been uh, visiting Göttingen and he had met Riemann there. He spoke uh, very well German French, and French. And uh, he had Become uh, a good friend of Riemann, and so one of his very important uh, uh, actions, while becoming the first uh, director of the Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa, uh, and also minister, he was also minister of education uh, in the first. Uh, government uh, of Italy after uh, Cavour, in the government uh, <clears throat> directed by uh, <coughs> Bettino Ricasoli. It was quite often in Torino because at the time uh, capital was Torino, of course. And uh, his um, uh, role in uh, establishing in the new kingdom of Italy um, a good education in mathematics uh, and in general establishing the new structure of education uh, in the United Kingdom of Italy was very important. He, he was one of the main 
reference point for the so-called Kazati law, which was the first uh, organization of public school in the United Kingdom of Italy. Uh, they created the, the two, uh, they created the classical lyceum, they created the school for um, uh, elementary teachers, uh, scuole magistrali. All this organization of uh, 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 the public elementary schools that were unified with programs, et cetera, et cetera, were largely to, due to Kazat and other councillors, but Betty had an important uh, uh, role there. And uh, he, among the other things, translated into Italian from the Greek, the book uh, of Euclid, and with commentaries and adaptation. And the book of, of Euclidean geometry due to Betty was the main text for geometry in Italian school up to probably uh, uh, World War II. Uh, so, Betty later became also senator, was a very prominent figure of the new United Italy, and a very, very uh, brilliant mathematician. And he was friend of Riemann, and because of that, since Riemann was suffering very badly from uh, tuberculosis, and in fact, at the end, he died quite young, at the age of 39, uh, he invited uh, Riemann to come to Pisa in order to have a better, at the time, it was thought that a better climate would help those uh, who suffered from tuberculosis. And Riemann spent two years in Pisa and came to speak Italian quite well. Uh, there are letters, uh, Riemann's letter to Betty that are written in Italian, and it is indeed, I had the opportunity to read a couple of them. They're really written in very good Italian. So Riemann was in Pisa for two years, and this is very important thing because Pisa became the first place where the idea in, in the rest of the world, apart from Göttingen, where the ideas of Riemann about uh, Riemannian geometry, what nowadays we call Riemannian geometry, were deposed. And Ricci Curbastro, who was alumnus of Betty, had the opportunity, probably, to hear something about Riemann. Riemann died before he became a student in Pisa, but the tradition of what Riemann had said in his notes, uh, uh, Dini, Ulisse Dini and Betty told many things about uh, Riemann's ideas. So Ricci and Bianchi, who were both the students of Betty, had the opportunity to absorb quite early the ideas uh, of uh, Riemann. Then Betty sent both of them, first Ricci and then uh, uh, Bianchi, to study in Germany with Felix Klein. And this is the road Sorry. Ah, buongiorno, ispettore. Buongiorno, buongiorno. Eh, mi scusi, sto facendo lezione, ma comunque l'ascolto. <laughs> senza dubbio, senza dubbio. Mi dica che ora devo venire. Giovedì mattina può andare bene, sì, mi dica che ora. Per le nove e mezza, d'accordo, d'accordo, vengo senz'altro. Beh, è in tribunale, no? Eh... Sì. 
Va bene, va bene. Eh, eh, scusi, lei è l'ispettore d'Ambra? Ah, bene, allora faccio il suo nome per... Eh... Va bene, d'accordo. Nove e mezzo allora, eh, di giovedì nove e mezza. Benissimo, grazie, grazie, arrivederla. Scusate, uh, I, I beg your pardon uh, I had the phone call. Um, okay, so uh, the, um, uh, the situation is like that, that there is this continuous uh, uh, transfer of ideas. You have to understand uh, something that nowadays uh, seems almost uh, ridiculous. Uh, because we have uh, continuous communication, we, we read the preprints, uh, we have web webinars and all that. But in the 19th century, the ideas were already spread, but, but were spread in much uh, slower way because people had to read the papers, had to know about papers, they were exchanging letters, and travels were not so fast as nowadays. And maybe now with the COVID, uh, we are going back to that age. Um, so um, the ideas of Riemann went to Italy uh, and then through Italy uh, uh, back to Germany and Richie Kurbaster, not uh, surprisingly, when he became professor in Padua, uh, was the one who developed uh, tensor calculus together with his uh, student, Tullio Levi Civita. And there would be no theory of general relativity, no Einstein, no cosmology, nothing of that type if Ricci had not developed uh, what he called the, the absolute uh, differential calculus. Uh, which we call tensor calculus. Um, that is modern differential geometry. And uh, Riemann, uh, sorry, and Einstein would not have uh, found the correct uh, equation of the gravitational field without uh, the help of Bianchi identities developed by Bianchi in 1903 that were known to Levi Civita. And Levi Civita was the one who explained to Einstein how to do it. And uh, all that is historical. We have all the letters uh, written by Einstein to Levi Civita and, and, its, uh, uh, and the answers. And uh, you have to understand that Einstein was referring to Levi Civita with the highest uh, respect. It was like a student talking to a professor, to an important professor. History is not uh, so clear about, but by the, the real uh, credits. Of course, Einstein had uh, in very important role to play with his physical ideas. But he would not have realized them if not with the help of such people as uh, Tullio Levi Civita and Ricci. Uh, so, and Ricci would not have done what he did if uh, Riemann had not traveled uh, to Pisa, invited by Betty, and would not have uh, understood uh, the mixture of geometry and group theory if he had not been at the seminars of Felix Klein in Munich. So coming back to Felix Klein and uh, Lee um, Times, after his uh, period in Munich, Felix Klein was appointed uh, on a special chair of, of geometry in Leipzig, where he stayed a few years. And as I told you, in this years in Leipzig, he dispatched his uh, 
best student angels to Lee in Norway. Uh, so they developed together. Engels always worked with Lee for almost the rest of Lee's life. Uh, and uh, Klein, after six years in Leipzig, was appointed on the most uh, famous, most uh, prestigious uh, chair of mathematics that existed in Germany namely the chair of mathematics uh, in Göttingen that had been the chair of uh, first of Gauss then of Dedekind and then of Riemann so Klein went to Göttingen and since he never forgot his good friend Lee he managed with his influence uh, to convince uh, the faculty of Leipzig and the rector of Leipzig University to appoint on the chair that he was leaving, going to Göttingen, to appoint on that chair his friend Sophus Lee, who therefore came to Leipzig and there he lived uh, several, several years, developing the theory of transformation groups. Uh, that we nowadays call uh, Lie algebras. His monumental work uh, was uh, written in German in three books uh, together with Engels. But he was treating Lie algebras uh, case by case. Uh, many examples, many theorems. He was, he was thinking particularly of these groups always as groups of differential first order operators acting on uh, some space. And in view of the theory of differential equations. Another person who contributed something astonishing to mathematics was a very modest person So let me show you. I made uh, here a map that I called uh, the roads of symmetries. And I'm depicting there the various uh, shifts uh, of these people. Uh, first, uh, Lee going from Norwegia to uh, Germany. Uh, then they together Lee and uh, Lee um, and Klein went to Paris. Then uh, Lee went back uh, through Italy uh, to Germany and uh, Norway. Uh, Why Klein went to, first to Erlangen, then to Munich, and then to Leipzig, and then from Leipzig to Göttingen. Okay, so that is the story of Lee and. Uh, and uh, line that I told you. But now we come to this man with a beard, whose name uh, is Willem Killing, uh, who I describe as an isolated uh, genius. Uh, Killing was born in 1847, and he died after war. War I in 1923. Uh, he was born in Siegen, a small center near Siegen, and he died in Münster. At the beginning, Killing uh, got a very good education. He was a very religious person, by the way, and he was Catholic, not Lutheran, because he came from the Catholic part of Germany. Um, he suffered at the end of uh, the last part of his life uh, very serious uh, blows uh, because he lost both of his sons uh, during World War I. They fell on the front as victims of the war. Both 
He had two sons and they both died in war. Uh, so Killing had a very, very good education, classical education. He was very proficient in Greek, Latin, and even in Hebrew. He studied also Hebrew. And uh, he made a life of, uh, for himself giving lectures uh, in a local school in Latin and Greek. He was professor of Liceum uh, for some time. But he had a very in, um, high interest in mathematics. And at a certain point, he went to Berlin and studied mathematics with Kummer, Weierstrass, and Helmholtz. He received a doctoral degree in 72. So uh, the same year when uh, Klein made their Langen program, and he was uh, developing Lie algebras uh, in then uh, he wanted to make, uh, he probably wanted to make a, an academic career, but uh, he had not enough uh, support. Uh, and so he accepted um, an appointment as uh, a teacher and then as a principal of a school in uh, Eastern Prussia. Nowadays, uh, uh, this place is uh, in Poland, uh, almost uh, at uh, the um, boundary with the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, the former Königsberg. Uh, and there he was completely isolated from the main streams uh, of mathematical thought, but nevertheless, he conceived something astonishing. He didn't even knew, he didn't even know that uh, uh, Lee had developed uh, Lee algebras. But he started uh, with a different approach, motivated by the study of geometry, according to group theory by Klein. He had better knowledge of Klein work than Lee. And so he started. Uh, inquiring about infinitesimal transformations. And he came to the notion of Lie algebras by that way, which is more modern in a way and more abstract than the, than the road followed by Lee. And so he made, uh, he also came to uh, the idea that uh, this infinitesimal transformation, what we call nowadays generator of transformation. You learn in quantum mechanics, uh, the algebra of the angular momentum, for instance, right? J commuted, Jx commuted with Jy makes Jz, etc., etc. This is the simplest example of a Lie algebra. He came to uh, this notion and he started trying to classify these algebras, something that Lee had not at all started. And, and then uh, he had made uh, some progress, completely isolated on that road, and thought that he might write a letter about, uh, he wrote that in a, small uh, uh, set of notes that with a very humble name uh, it called program shrift uh, I mean notes of a program uh, in German and he sent these notes that he himself uh, uh, wrote and, and published uh, uh, in his uh, Lyceum uh, that there was some simple typ typography there and he obtained a few copies of these notes, and he sent some in a letter, these notes uh, to Felix Klein, the most famous mathematician of the time. Uh, that was uh, 1884. Klein told, uh, looked at this uh, work of feeling and told him, look, 
what you do is very similar to what uh, does my good friend uh, Lee. So please uh, write to Lee and tell him uh, about your work. So Killing did that, wrote to Lee and asked him to send him, if possible, his papers that he wanted to study because he thought he was doing something similar. Lee was a good man, but he was very bad. He had a very bad character and took uh, this uh, letter from a known German, from a very remote place, uh, no university, some school, almost as an insult. And uh, he sent him uh, his papers in an envelope and he told him, look, you have one year time to read this paper, then you have to return them to me. <laughs> Very strange, huh? Killing made no objection. He studied uh, papers of, uh, of Lee, probably clarified many of his ideas. And then he sent them back uh, as agreed, no, with German precision. By that time, uh, he came to know that uh, uh, Lee had arrived in Germany and was appointed on the chair in Leipzig. So he thought that it would be very nice if he could meet with the Lee. And uh, through, uh, I have to stress that his Lyceum was uh, a Catholic school uh, organized by the church, by the Catholic church. Uh, so through the Catholic organization to which he belonged, he got uh, the, he managed to be uh, sent on a trip to another uh, center of the same organization for some affairs, some affairs to, to, to deal with uh, in Heidelberg. And he had probably chosen Heidelberg because on the road from uh, his place in Eastern Prussia to, he to Heidelberg, uh, Lipsia was in between. Uh, Leipzig was in between. So he stopped in Leipzig and, and asked uh, uh, to visit uh, uh, Lee. He had a very short talk with Lee, who insulted him and told him, what do you pretend? Uh, you pretend that you have invented Lee algebra, so uh, I don't want to hear you and uh, send him away. Uh, very humiliating him. But Engels was present, and after this uh, um, sort of uh, humiliating uh, interview uh, with uh, Lee, Engels uh, came to him and told him, look, don't pay attention. Lee is a good person, but he, he has a very bad character. But what I heard from you is extremely interesting, and therefore, uh, I invite you to continue your researches. And if you want to discuss them with me, uh, sending letters to me, please do. Uh, and forget for the moment about Lee. Two years or three years later, uh, following advice here are the roads of symmetry, Killing and Lee. A uh, couple of years later, in 86, in 87, um, well, even one year later, in 87, Killing wrote to Engel that he had perfectioned the definition of what now we call semi-simple Lie algebras, a notion, classificate, a very important notion that allows for the classification that Lee had not grasped. Having this more abstract, approach, it came to uh, the notion of simple Lie algebras. And in uh, uh, two-year times, 
he published with the help of Engels and Lee his complete classification of Lie algebras in three papers on an Annalen der Mathematique, which was the principal review of mathematics uh, founded by uh, Felix Kahn. It is astonishing because he invented all the tools, modern tools, for the classification of Lie algebras. He invented what later has been known in the posterity as Cartan subalgebras, but he invented before Cartan. He invented the notion of roots, a root system, and he classified the root systems, which is the classification of the algebra. See, if you will follow my course next year in Lie groups uh, and theory of groups, you will learn about it. And moreover, in this classification, he found the three abstractional cases that could not be traced back to what nowadays we call the classical groups, rotational groups, uh, symplectic groups, uh, unitary groups. There were five exceptional cases that he could not uh, reduce uh, to any known uh, type of group. Hmm? Five type of algebras that it could not be reduced to any known groups. So he tried quite uh, strongly to find the mistake, uh, to find an argument why these cases should be uh, removed, but he didn't find any. And so also with the um, suggestion of Engels, who told him, don't worry, you discovered something, publish it. He published. And in fact, Exceptional Lie algebras were found by him. This is his major discovery. He found uh, the root system that corresponds to this algebra, but he had no representation. It was the genius of Cartan, some years later, to reconsider uh, killing papers was the topic uh, of Cartan's uh, doctoral thesis uh, in Ecole Normale. And uh, he revisited all demonstrations, all proofs of killing, refined also them, but essentially killing was right. But what is important he constructed explicitly the fundamental representation of this algebra. So, so he proved by construction that this algebra existed. These are G2, F4, E6, E7, and E8. And it was the major advance of Cartan at the level of his doctoral thesis to introduce uh, the fundamental representation of these algebras. Curiously, the paper of Cartan, a Frenchman, probably Cartan is the most outstanding mathematician of the 19th, of the 20th century, at least of the first half of the 20th century, and certainly he became active at the end of the 19th century. He is a giant of mathematics. Um, but um, curiously, he, he defended this thesis in Ecole Normale in French, but uh, the paper associated with this thesis was published in German, in, uh, in, in, in the German paper of uh, Felix Klein. So at the time, many French mathematicians spoke German, like all 
German mathematician spoke French as well. Um, so this is the story of Lie algebras. And uh, uh, we have met in this story, the origins of modern physics. Because theory of groups, the theory of, differ, uh, of differential geometry, that are the pillars of modern view on all interactions. Differential geometry is the es essential ingredient of the theory of gravitation, according later the, to Einstein general theory of relativity, while group theory is the essential ingredient, the Lie algebras and the various uh, group, groups uh, are the major ingredient uh, in the theory of all other interactions. And in particular, Lorentz group is at the origin of special relativity that mixed with uh, in views uh, became the theory of relativity. So after all this, we are coming now, uh, this I already explained to you, uh, and uh, I will make uh, a jump Let me see. Because we have to do special relativity versus general relativity. We will go back uh, after we discuss that. So let's say the following. Uh, my my um, lecture today has been very intense, a uh, lot of concepts, so probably uh, I will stop at 5.30 because uh, if we go too much, uh, I mean, if we put too much material in one, in one lecture, uh, you have not enough time to, to, to think about it. So, uh, what I want uh, uh, to discuss uh, for in the, uh, as preliminary discussion uh, in this um, last 10 minutes uh, is the difference uh, between general relativity and special relativity. Uh, special relativity emerged uh, from Maxwell equation, of course, because uh, the historical path was that of studying Maxwell equations, realizing that Maxwell equations uh, are not invariant under Galileo transformations at constant time. And our friend, the Dutch mathematician Lawrence, found the group of transformations uh, under which uh, Maxwell equations are invariant. And that was the beginning of what initiated uh, the reflections and the consideration of Einstein that it could not be that a part of physics, uh, namely Newton physics uh, that describes uh, uh, gravitation, is invariant under one group of transformation, 
And another part of physics, electromagnetism, is invariant against another group of physics. Because we live in the same world. And uh, electromagnetism uh, coexists uh, with gravitation. We even make uh, electrical engines uh, uh, where, by means of electricity, we make wheels uh, move, etc., uh, etc. Et and mechanics obeys uh, Newton's law, and uh, so uh, as the symmetry of Galileo, and the other part uh, as the symmetry of Lorentz. The two things cannot coexist. Uh, 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 there is certainly a discrepancy. So. The problem was that either Maxwell is wrong, but Maxwell turned out to be absolutely right, or it is Newton to be wrong. So mechanics had to be redefined according to Lorentz transformations. That was the beginning of special relativity. And the criticism that Einstein made of the notion of simultaneity uh, that is relative. Uh, two things can happen at the same time for some observer, why they happen at different times for other observers and things like that. Um, but uh, later, as we know, Einstein was not satisfied with special relativity and wanted to make general relativity because uh, he thought that still mechanics had been adapted to uh, Lorentz transformation, but also the law of gravitation had to be adapted. And that brought him to think of uh, what nowadays we call general relativity, and he could not have developed it unless uh, he had the help of Tullio Levi Civita and Ricci. So, the main discovery due to Michelson and Morley, the experiment of Michelson and Morley, proved that there was not any ether, that uh, electromagnetic uh, waves propagated at the same speed and then the, for all observers, and that is what uh, is explained by uh, Lawrence. But the space time of special relativity, now let's look at it from a geometrical point of view, which we will call Minkowski space. By the way, Minkowski was uh, a German uh, mathematician of Jewish origin. And in fact, uh, uh, he was born within the boundaries uh, of the Russian Empire at that time, because Poland was part of Russia, as you might know. But he studied uh, in Germany and was at any, in any way, a German. And Minkowski developed the notion of Minkowski space, four dimensional space, um, that was so important uh, uh, to realize in a geometrical way the substratum where the Lorentz uh, transformation become obvious. Uh, it was not Einstein, it was Minkowski uh, who contributed this uh, mathematical proper vision. But Minkowski space is not the space of general relativity, because Minkowski space is still, from the mathematical point of view, a vector space. So it is an affine space. It is not curved, and in uh, Minkowski space, 
it is still possible to talk about absolute distance. Two events, namely two points of Minkowski space, like in Euclidean space, can be given a distance. This distance might be zero because Minkowski space includes null vectors. Vector norm is zero, the light vectors. But still there is this notion that makes it an affine space. Space there can find the absolute length of a curve. Uh, sorry, uh, the absolute distance of the point. The main difference with general relativity is that we have to renounce the idea of absolute distance because in a curve space, the only thing that we can measure is not the absolute distance between two points, but it is the length of any curve that joins this uh, point. And we can minimize it if we want, if we want or extremize it. And the curves that extremize the length between um, and their length between two points are called the geodesics. Uh, so special relativity differs conceptually in a very profound way from special relativity. That is only a step in between. And I think uh, with this uh, observation, we have to stop for the moment. And uh, next uh, uh, lecture, tomorrow, we will talk about uh, the general concept of uh, classical physics, uh, the status of classical physics between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, and the role of Maxwell equation. And we will come back to show that in actually Maxwell equation is Maxwell theory is the first example of what we will call a gauge theory. Obviously, Maxwell was not aware of that. But it's always good to look in retrospective how theories of the past can be understood from a modern standpoint. Okay, so I propose to meet tomorrow at six, uh, at 16 as today. And uh, I want to uh, wish you a nice continuation of your afternoon. Unless you have questions, of course. Could you hear me? Ah, bene, perché c'è sempre un ritardo e ogni tanto mi viene il timore di aver parlato nel vuoto. No, non la sento, io non ho domande. Non ha domande, nessuna di voi ha domande. Io le volevo chiedere una cosa invece. Sì? Secondo lei, per quale motivo la matematica dell'Ottocento si è sviluppata principalmente in Germania? Beh, diciamo... Uh, prima di tutto non è completamente vero che sia no infatti abbiamo, abbiamo visto anche del, dei casi in Italia cioè nel senso Beh, in Francia io direi che la matematica dell'ottocento si è sviluppata soprattutto in Germania e in Francia ok Francia e Germania uh, se vuole la mia opinione del perché gliela dico subito allora, la, per quanto riguarda la Francia, c'è una chiara influenza della rivoluzione francese e di Napoleone. Se lei va a vedere, eh, anche senza fare troppe 
riflessioni eh, difficili, ma semplicemente menzionando i nomi più importanti dei matematici francesi dell'Ottocento, dell'inizio Ottocento e dei loro contributi, eh, è incredibile. Fourier, Laplace, Legendre, eh, poi Cauchy, eh, ma D'Alembert, sono tutti a cavallo tra la fine del Settecento e l'inizio dell'Ottocento e corrispondono all'enorme impulso che è stato dato alle scienze dalla rivoluzione francese, prima, con la sua visione razionale del mondo che diciamo, ha favorito la... e poi dalla creazione delle scuole speciali fatte da Napoleone. L'école polytechnique, l'école normale, che poi sono state portate anche in, Fran anche in Italia con la scuola normale di Pisa, è un, uno sforzo consapevole di Napoleone di creare scuole per la Repubblica eh, e per le esigenze anche militari eh, della Francia. Col Politecnica infatti è una scuola militare, ma la visione napoleonica, Napoleone era, era tutt'altro che uno stupido, era anzi una persona molto colta e molto attirata dalle scienze, quindi è stato un grande propulsore delle scienze. Per quanto riguarda la Germania, possiamo dire che proprio perché la Germania è stata inizialmente contagiata dalla rivoluzione francese eh, e secondariamente anche se la Prussia ha poi combattuto la Francia e anzi è stata uno degli elementi eh, determinanti nella caduta di Napoleone però la Prussia dalla Francia ha imparato l'importanza delle eh, scuole pubbliche e il pensiero di, eh, di, Enge, di, eh, di Hegel scusi il pensiero di Hegel de, che eh, la filosofia hegeliana che vedeva nello Stato una categoria fondamentale ha favorito la creazione eh, di molte università, eh, la, sistematizzazione, la sistemazione pubblica di queste università e soprattutto una cosa molto banale, i buoni stipendi. I professori tedeschi godevano di ottimi stipendi, nel, nel, era una buona eh, carriera quella di diventare professore universitario in Germania. Eh, erano molto stimati, molto apprezzati, eh, curati dalla, dallo Stato e quindi si sono create le condizioni per cui eh, le scuole di pensiero scientifico e quindi soprattutto matematico eh, avessero... Eh, uno sviluppo. Naturalmente poi c'è anche il, diciamo, la tradizione, quando qualche grande genio appare e ha la possibilità di sviluppare una scuola, la scuola cresce. Quindi uno degli elementi fondamentali per la Germania, ma per tutta l'Europa, è stata la presenza di Gauss. Gauss gigante nella matematica e la scuola di Gauss a Göttingen ha, ha, ha dato un impulso enorme eh, a, alla matematica tedesca. E, quindi diciamo ci sono questi vari elementi. La Spagna per esempio è stata completamente fuori nell'Ottocento. L'Italia devo dire Dov'è che ha contribuito? Eh, 
l'abbiamo già, già un po' indicato. I centri importanti in Italia sono stati il Granducato di Toscana per via di Pisa, dove c'è stata un travaso attraverso Riemann della matematica tedesca e, e poi ci sono state persone di grandissimo livello come appunto Petti che ha creato una scuola importante. L'altro centro è Padova che ha beneficato indirettamente eh, dell'antica tradizione eh, galileiana, della nobile tradizione eh, diciamo dell'università patavina della Repubblica di San Marco eccetera, questo non va ignorato, ma nello stesso tempo dell'organizzazione austro-ungarica che ha dato agli Atenei eh, notevoli, eh, notevoli possibilità e non a caso Padova è stato un decento. Eh, infine possiamo menzionare Torino. Torino ha avuto un notevole ruolo soprattutto eh, nella seconda metà dell'Ottocento, eh, ma la tradizione torinese è direttamente collegata a Napoleone, eh, alla Grange torinese che è diventato uno dei più grandi scienziati d'Europa, poi francese. Quindi la connessione di Torino con la Francia attraverso Giovanni Plan, nostro grandissimo astronomo, eh, professore all'Università di Torino e allievo di Lagrange e non solo, ma anche eh, parente di Lagrange perché ne sposò la nipote. Quindi, diciamo, questo gioco... Eh, ha lasciato da l'Inghilterra ha avuto nel Regno Unito ha avuto i, i suoi contributi come abbiamo visto ma molto eh, più isolati e difficili proprio perché Napoleone non aveva creato le scuole pubbliche e abbiamo visto la difficoltà della vita di grandi matematici inglesi come Cayley e, e Sylvester e c'è da ricordare che Maxwell, eh, scozzese, eh, ha avuto anche lui le sue difficoltà, tanto che gli sono state rifiutate delle borse di studio. Quindi il Regno Unito, che non ha, pur essendo un grande paese industriale, è diventato più grande, ma con la sua struttura ancora molto medievale, perché non ammodernata dalla rivoluzione francese, ha dato contributi, devo dire, sostanzialmente minori alla matematica moderna rispetto alla Francia e alla Germania. E io ci metterei pure l'Italia, perché l'Italia ha dato, soprattutto la seconda metà dell'Ottocento, non può. Non può. La soddisfa la risposta? Sì, mi soddisfa, grazie. Ma perché praticamente a me, nel senso, è sempre sorto un po' il dubbio, non il dubbio, però eh, diciamo eh, all'inizio magari la cultura era più concentrata sul Mediterraneo, sulle coste, cioè siamo passati da una cultura prettamente magari greca, eh, così, e poi vediamo che invece la cultura si sposta nella zona europea più continentale, ma anche a livello filosofico. Eh, Nell'Ottocento, da quello che avevo studiato io anche alle superiori, anche la filosofia, l'arte, la letteratura, a partire dall'Ottocento inizia a concentrarsi tutta verso la Francia, la Germania e l'Italia. E l'Italia settentrionale, però. Eh, esatto. Ma è, è ovvio, c'è sempre una relazione geopolitica. Eh, L'Italia che ha insegnato agli altri nell'epoca del rinascimento quasi tutto è diventata un paese marginale eh, nel 600 e nel 700 
è andata un paese provinciale perché è disunita eh, politicamente, perché l'asse ehm, dei grandi avvenimenti eh, geopolitici si è spostata sugli oceani, dal Mediterraneo, l'importanza della scoperta dell'America e, e quindi dei traffici, continu- eh, diciamo non più mediterranei ma oceanici, ha spostato... Ehm, il centro di gravità sulla Francia, l'Inghilterra, inizialmente la Spagna, ma la Spagna si è suicidata eh, con l'inflazione. La Spagna è, il, 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 eh, anzi, con la deflazione. Eh, la Spagna è il più preclaro esempio di come una grande potenza possa suicidarsi eh, facendo le scelte sbagliate. Perché? creato il più grande impero del, su cui non tramontava mai il sole, gli spagnoli che avevano alla fine del, del 400, l'inizio del 500, una delle economie più vivaci del continente e che con la scoperta dell'America avrebbero potuto fare faville, fecero due cose che sono le più stupide del mondo. Una, cacciarono gli ebrei, che erano la forza eh, economica preponderante eh, del Regno di Castiglia e e di Aragona. La seconda, con l'importazione dell'oro spagnolo, dell'oro americano, scusate, che veniva dal Messico e dal Perù soprattutto, le Ande, eh, fecero che cosa? Uccisero la propria industria nascente perché l'oro in mano agli Hidalgo, soprattutto ai grandi di Spagna, permetteva loro di comprare fatti, i manufatti francesi, inglesi, con l'oro. E quindi suicidarono la propria industria e la Spagna piano piano divenne un paese sottosviluppato dove c'erano soltanto i grandi, i grandi di Spagna che avevano i, i, i denari e, 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 e gli altri eh, invece diventavano sempre più miserabili e, 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 e la Spagna si, 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 si trasformò in quello che era poi un paese anche, anche quello, nonostante la, la grandeur del suo impero, decadente. Mentre la Francia era il paese più popoloso d'Europa, con, la, con l'agricoltura più favorevole, e sviluppò anche l'industria. Lì fu la corona perché eh, le prime manifatture in Francia sono di tipo reale, ma nello stesso tempo si sviluppò quella classe di eh, nobiltà cosiddetta di toga, no? non erano più i, no- i nobili feudali furono neutralizzati dalla corona di Francia facendoli andare tutti a Versailles a perdere tempo nei balli e e rendendoli eh, eh, quindi inefficaci, impotenti e e poco rilevanti. Nello stesso tempo la corona diede luogo allo sviluppo della nuova eh, nobiltà di toga, cioè dei giudici, degli degli esattori, dei funzionari di Stato eh, da cui si staccò piano piano la nuova borghesia e la nuova borghesia francese fu quella che diede luogo poi allo sviluppo della filosofia, delle lettere eh, 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 e pose le basi della rivoluzione francese. Né di cioè Montesquieu è ancora un nobile che però è già passato un po' dall'altra parte, ma non era uno dei grandi, dei grandi di, di Francia. E eh, 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 la piccola, pensiamo a Fermat, che era un giudice, 
ed è il primo grande matematico francese. Ehm, quindi questa evoluzione della Francia che la porta alla rivoluzione e poi la rivoluzione che propaga il tutto. La Germania viene un po' dopo, perché la Germania eh, è eh, diciamo un paese come l'Italia, disunito, ma eh, piano piano eh, ci sono due aree, l'area più colta e più sviluppata intellettualmente della Germania è la Renania, che è contigua alla Francia. I grandi, pensi la musica, Beethoven era, era, era di Bonn, eh, Heine era eh, Renano eh, tra, i, tra i letterati. Eh, ma ehm, la Prussia era più feudale, più antica, eccetera. Però ha questa, man mano, eh, la storia poi è capricciosa, si afferma come potenza militare, ma nello stesso tempo ha questo pregio della grande organizzazione, ma acquisendo poi la Renania, acquista anche la cultura. E, insomma, nel bene e nel male, la, Fran la Germania diventa un luogo eh, di sviluppo delle scienze, della filosofia, eccetera, importante per questi motivi, mm. ma soprattutto nell'Ottocento. Beh, qualche grande filosofo tedesco c'è stato anche nel, nel Settecento, dimentichiamoci Leibniz. E, e poi, naturalmente, non dobbiamo dimenticare l'aspetto la controriforma alla decadenza dovuta al fatto che i centri commerciali si spostano sull'Atlantico è quello che uccide il nostro paese. La controriforma cattolica uccide la cultura, neutralizza e provincializza l'Italia per due secoli, poi piano piano rinasce. Quindi ci sono questi vari fattori. Certamente ha ragione lei comunque a dire che lo spostamento dal Mediterraneo al centro Europa, ma questo è indubbiamente dovuto in primis alle scoperte geografiche che, che portano le nazioni che hanno accesso all'Atlantico a diventare preminenti rispetto alle nazioni mediterranee. No? e la Spagna sta a metà perché sta a metà sul Mediterraneo e metà, metà sul, eh, sull'Atlantico però no? abbiamo detto cosa è successo sì grazie la ringrazio prego, prego. E sulla chat c'è una domanda se magari non l'ha ancora vista no nella chat c'è una domanda me, me sì, la ripeta a voce perché non la vedo eh, che chiede che cos'è una varietà di Keller? Una varietà di Keller è, è una cosa che le spiego volentieri, ma non so eh, se ha già i mezzi per comprenderlo. Eh, io glielo dico. Eh, prima di tutto, una varietà di Keller è una varietà complessa. Quindi è una varietà differenziabile su cui possiamo costruire una struttura complessa e quindi possiamo utilizzare come coordinate coordinate che sono numeri complessi. E questo è il numero uno. Numero due, una varietà è di Keller se la metrica che noi costruiamo eh, è ermitiana è una matrice ermitiana, ma con la metrica ermitiana noi possiamo poi costruire una due forma, che è la metrica moltiplicata per la cosiddetta struttura complessa. Questa diventa una, una, una forma differenziale. Se questa forma differenziale è chiusa, allora la varietà si dice di Keller. 
E per le varietà di Keller c'è una cosa importante che la metrica si può dedurre facendo due derivate su una funzione reale delle variabili complesse. Keller introdusse le metriche eh, che portano il suo nome eh, negli anni 30 e il lavoro, pensate un po', lo pubblicò in Italia perché a quell'epoca la scuola matematica di Roma dove c'era Tullio Levicivita, Segre, eh, dove c'era Castelnuovo era probabilmente la più brillante d'Europa e anche lì bisogna dire che la fine della scuola di Roma è dovuta alle leggi razziali del fascismo perché dei maggiori matematici della scuola di Roma nove decimi erano ebrei e con le, e con le leggi razziali furono tutti eh, mandati declassati e tolti dalla cattedra e molti riuscirono a fuggire prima di finire ancora peggio la matematica romana non si risollevò più. È la stessa cosa che capitò con la Germania, che la matematica e la fisica tedesca erano in larga parte di, di matrice ebraica. E quindi Göttingen, che era la capitale mondiale della matematica, eh, fu annichilata da Hitler. Non si risollevò mai più. Eh? e questo è un pensiero molto triste sia umanamente che anche sull'idiozia umana vabbè <ride> ma non so se sono riuscito a spiegare che cos'è una varietà di chele perché deve studiare un po' di geometria differenziale prima non so se l'ha già fatto <ride> Ha detto di sì la ragazza in chat, troppo. Ah, bene, bene. Allora vuol dire che ha già le nozioni sufficienti per capirmi. Benissimo. Allora, se non ci sono altre domande, vi saluto e ci vediamo domani. Prof, scusi, una proposta un po' così, ma se domani siamo ancora noi a partecipare sì, la lezione, sì. potrebbe essere fatta in italiano oppure, oppure sì, sì. no? Sì, io non, non ho nessuna difficoltà a farla in italiano. L'ho fatta in inglese perché ci sono studenti inglesi di non italiani che magari se la sentono dopo, ma la faccio tranquillamente in italiano. Tanto mi sembra di capire che gli unici due studenti stranieri sono una è una cinese che parla italiano e l'altro uno spagnolo che l'italiano forse lo capisce ancora meglio dell'inglese. Eh? Penso di sì, perché seguono altri corsi, quindi penso di sì anche. Eh, io non ho difficoltà, faccio in italiano volentierissimo. Va bene. Va bene. <ride> ok, allora a domani. A domani. Grazie, troppo a domani. Grazie, arrivederci. 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 Buon pomeriggio anche a voi.